Peter, can you hear me? This is uh, Darren Anderson. Yes, I can hear you. Chair, continuing the roll call. This is uh, calling for the presence of Commissioner Cribs. Here. I just got sound now. Yes, thank you. Chair, thank that you. is. Thank you, and I'll, I'll just repeat the introduction uh, so it'll be on, on the recording and for the, the Zoom audience. Well, welcome to the April 26th regular meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, we just completed roll call, uh, which we won't, we won't redo. There was a little problem with the audio initially. Uh, and uh, all commissioners are here. Uh, council, our council liaison, uh, Tom Du Bois, the council member Du Bois is, is not with us this evening. Uh, so we can go ahead and proceed with the uh, business of the adoption of the resolution authorizing use of teleconferencing for Parks and Recreation Commission meeting during the COVID-19 state of emergency. And this is an action. And do I have a motion to approve the the action, which is something that we've been doing every every month to permit uh, to authorize hybrid meetings. Uh, So moved. Thank you, and a second, please. I'll second it. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Yeah. Chair Here. Vice Chair Lemaire? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, yes. <laughs> Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Kleinhaus? Yes. Chair, that's a 6-0 vote. Thank you, appreciate that. Are there, I do not see any members of the public who are looking to comment on an item not on this evening's agenda. Uh, if, if anybody does have anything to say, they would need to tune in now and, and raise your hand, please. Uh, and not seeing that, let's uh, move on to the next item, which is agenda changes, additions, and deletions. Does even anyone have any requests for any of the above actions? 
then we will continue on to the our first to our next action item, which is approval of the draft minutes from the March 22nd Parks and Recreation meeting. Does anyone have any comments regarding the minutes? I, I, I do have a comment. The, the last, last month we talked about making sure that we had the minutes or the actions properly included in the minutes so that we possible to approved and, and, and record it uh, properly for viewing. In, in this month's minutes, the action is referenced as being uh, referring to the all of the items that, that were documented by, by LOM in the meeting, but the actual attachment of the work plan, which we which was the action that we vote we voted on was not included. So it's it's important to include that attachment and and actually it's important to include a, an attachment of any presentation uh, given uh, at a commission meeting. Uh, so I I will not be voting to approve the, the minutes and until we can get that uh, included. Uh, any other comments regarding the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve. And, and a second. I'll second. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Chair Greenfield. No. Vice Chair Lemaire. Uh, yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Kleinhaus? Yes. Chair, that's a 5 1 vote. Thank you. Next up is the department report, please. Good evening, Chair, Commissioners. Darren Anderson with Community Services Department. Very good to see you. Um, a couple updates from City Council. City Council interviewed five applicants for our vacant Parks and Recreation Commission last night. The Council will make their appointment at their Monday, May 2nd meeting, which I believe is scheduled for 6.30. Um, this topic will come up at around 6.30. Last night, Council also reviewed the work plans for the Public Arts Commission, Utilities Advisory Commission, and the Stormwater Oversight Committee. The Parks and Recreation Commission work plan is scheduled for Council review on Wednesday, June 1st, 5 p.m. Adam Howard had asked me to pass along a request for two commissioners to join the judges task force for the Mayfet parade floats. Commissioner Brown has already volunteered, but we need two more commissioners. And uh, if you would please reach out to Adam Howard, um, I'll send you, if you haven't recently received one, an email with his contact information, and he'll give you the details on what the judges, where they'll meet, when. And just a reminder about the Mayfet parade, that's on May 7th. 10 a.m. and this year's theme is what empowers you which honors and pays tribute to the resilience of Palo Alto's youth and puts a focus on sustainability and the parade will start at 10 a.m. at the corner of University Ave and Emerson Street. Uh, just an update on some recreation camps. Summer camps are coming soon. In-person camps are at 81% capacity already so filling up quickly and some of our more popular camps like cooking, Lego invention camps already have large wait lists. Recreation staff are trying to accommodate these wait lists by adding additional sessions if space is available and adding more instructors um, is also available. They're looking to do that. Uh, an update on the Rincon Yada Park project. You may have heard about this one at the last meeting or in between these meetings, you may have heard the project was completed on April 1st. It was very successful. The new playground is quite popular with um, children playing on it the day it opened. Um, there are also new park benches, picnic tables, repaved pathways, and some native plantings. There will be a community celebration, an official grand opening of the Junior Museum and Zoo, the Rinconada Park, and the JMZ's new solar system exhibit. And that will be on Saturday, May 14th, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And there'll be an official ribbon cutting ceremony, speakers program with city and friends of the JMZ officials, family friendly entertainment, including a DJ, 
opportunities to encounter animals at the Junior Museum and free tours of the newly renovated JMZ and other fun, exciting things like free ice cream by treat bot and food trucks. Uh, the Coverly tennis courts are scheduled to be resurfaced starting this Monday, May 2nd. The project should be completed by approximately June 30th. Uh, an update on recruitment, as I think I've shared several times, we've been down positions in community services and in particular in parks and open space for quite some time. We recently filled our vacant park ranger position. This was filled by Nate McClure, who was promoted from a seasonal assistant ranger to a full-time park ranger. And he'll be stationed at the Baylands, but filling in throughout the open space preserves. And then our postings for our community, excuse me, our garden coordinator position, formerly held by Catherine Borkwin, who assisted the commission, a parks maintenance position and a parks irrigation position are all closed on their postings, which mean we'll be moving on to interviews fairly soon, which will be a big help to have our new people on. And we figure that will be around um, early June. Uh, some interesting wildlife updates. There was a bobcat with kittens observed at Foothills Nature Preserve, not far from the interpretive center. Uh, the wildflowers are blooming up at Foothills Nature Preserve right now. I really encourage people to come take a look. And the barn and cliff swallows have returned to the Baylands and are busy building their nests on the exterior of the Baylands Nature Center. And sure, that completes my department report. Thank you. Uh, any questions from commissioners? I have uh, one quick question. How has visitation been at uh, Foothills Park or Foothills Preserve rather? Yeah, staying, staying steady. Uh, we're about 100% over our historic average and that's been fairly consistent. So no closures. Um, and according to the rangers who are there the busier times on weekends, we haven't had the problems that we experienced on that initial opening, which was the you know vehicles parked in inappropriate places, way too many you know, pedestrian and and uh, and vehicle interactions making it a little hazardous. That has not been the case, so it seems manageable according to the ranger staff. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Darren um, Chair. Um, are there is there an update yet on um, the gyms A and B at Cubberly? Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Cribs. The update is the it's status quo that A and B are still closed. Uh, we're waiting for a second environmental analysis report, as I understand it, or environmental uh, consultation firms looking at it again. And we're, we still have the pavilion open where we're encouraging people to go there or some other neighboring gyms like the YMCA have been helpful in filling the role that a, gyms A and B used to fill. So um, I don't anticipate it reopening very soon, according to the information I have, but we are expecting a new report uh, to be coming soon. So we'll find Thank out more you. information. Alice? Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, tennis court uh, repairs. Is that, um, I guess that's already been communicated to the public and which, which courts were those? These are the outside courts at Cupperly. Okay. And we had signage there and actually got pushed out one week. We had signs saying it would be the, the week prior, contractor wasn't available and changed it on us and chose this new day. Okay. So we updated all the signage, informed the, the Coverly staff as well. Okay, so it'll be, it'll be open again on the 30th of June, I think you said? And uh, Approximately. I assume that there's, some, there's usually some limitations, I guess, on what people can and cannot do after the new courts. So that the information that will be... Um, Post it so they know, you know certain shoes you should wear and that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, my hope is when we open it, it should be open John, for regular John, business. And, John, and, or one other. and you could just, yeah, go back to standard operations. Okay. The, the delayed start may compromise that end date. That's why I, I mentioned approximately, but I'll you know, provide updates to the PRC and to the signage for the, the users at Coverly. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, sorry, the, the third position, staff positions being uh, filled, the garden coordinator, parks maintenance, and uh, uh, parks irrigation. Irrigation. Great. That's exciting news for you, I'm sure. That's great. Uh, and so the, the courts will be closed for roughly two months. Approximately, yes. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Is there any um, drought impacts coming up to the fields in the near term? I know the governor had an executive order that affected uh, jurisdictions non-functional turf. Is that something the department is addressing? Yeah, it's something we're planning for. We're expecting that to be hitting soon where we'll have to make those changes. And this rule specifically um, says that if it's aesthetic purposes basically or non-functional, I think is the terminology, that the turf cannot be irrigated using potable water. We have a few of those areas. The challenge usually, the other exception is if it's not used for some sort of recreation, that there be trees connected. And so that therein lies the challenge where we've got a given aesthetic piece of turf, but the trees are feeding off the irrigation for that lawn in many areas. We've brainstormed out and, and planned out where we're going to turn off head selectively. And it's going to look a little strange. So I'm glad you brought this up because I want to be real transparent. We're going to do everything we need to to make sure the trees stay alive. And what that means is on a given green piece of turf where you might have trees scattered all over, we are only able to turn off a certain heads. So there'll be these, these little brown either circles or or semicircles, and then green on the exterior. And it begs the question, well, why would you do that? It's entirely based around keeping the trees alive. We've got some signs that we used to do. Brown is the new green. You might remember those. We'll have those out. And I'll work with our utilities department to see if there isn't something clever that we can put up to kind of explain that strange look, like brown's the new green and we're saving our trees or something to that effect. Are, are there any plans to expand the irrigation to add bubblers near the trees uh, that, that could be selectively, that could be left on while being able to disable the, the sprinkler heads? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really, it needs to be when we design new irrigation systems to have the trees on a totally separate system would be far preferable. It's very difficult to do it piecemeal after the fact. Um, we have talked about that in certain situations and for special situations, it may be possible, but right now that's not the tact we're, we're taking. Thank you and, th and thanks for bringing up the issue. We'll obviously be talking a lot about trees later in the meeting, but it is important to stress the importance of making sure that trees get water even uh, during uh, water shortage periods. Thank you. No, for, no further questions, then we'll move on to our first uh, official business item, the ad hoc reports, looking for uh, updates uh, from it regarding any of the ad hoc uh, committees and li liaison roles, any updates to share with the commission. Who would like to start? I'm happy to start from the recreational opportunities ad hoc. Um, we've been meeting now on a weekly basis, um, and we're making progress collecting information from various parties um, regarding um, the gym and wellness center. Um, we've been reviewing the list of items that need to be in a gym and wellness center, and we'll be looking, continue to look at that along with potential locations, and we should have some cost analysis in the next couple of weeks. So we're feeling pretty positive about how things are going. Um, in terms of the skate park, I mean, Darren will, I think, speak about this later, but there's a meeting coming up um, on the 4th of May, which we're very happy about. Um, I believe that the um, golf first tee um, proposal or um, MOU or letter of intent will go to the council around the first week in May or the second week in May. So uh, making progress. Sounds great, thank you. You're welcome. Other, other updates? Uh, I met with staff and representative from the dog park group to review Mitchell Park proposed um, modifications to the dog park area at Mitchell Park. Um, it was great information and I'm sure we'll be coming to the full commission in the future. Um, and then on the court use, the ad hoc is reviewing some information from staff on restriping um, in advance of the senior games. So that will be forthcoming and we can report out at the next meeting. But I'll let anybody else add anything to that comment.
What is the date of the senior games? When would the work need, need to be completed? And what is the work? It's, it's changing the color of the pickleball striping um, on the multi-use courts um, to a different color. And so I know Adam went and looked at, and no, maybe you're the best person to report on this because you actually saw them, um, the colors at a Menlo Park facility, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, but when I'll, I think it was yesterday, the day before, days pass. Uh, and, um, you know, when you first hear about that, you're thinking that this yellow lines is going to be very disruptive or on a site uh, level to the tennis players. But when you get out there and look at it, it's a very subtle yellow. yellow. Uh, also, I was very impressed by the fact that they were able to squeeze two courts on each side of each each net. But I think the whole thing here was looking at the, the color. And, and it, I think that it can pretty much be done without uh, uh, any, uh, I think, complaints uh, from either party. I think it will benefit the... Uh, They'll answer the, the demands of the uh, pickleball community. And um, I think we're going to reach out to find out from the city if there were any complaints from any of the uh, tennis players. But I think what we're hearing that that, you know, I think people have been able to kind of uh, go along with how that you're able to take courts like that and make it multi-use multi uh, for, every, for everyone uh, concerned. So it was pretty impressive. I, th I think it's something we probably want to go with. So this is for the four multi-use courts at JLS, right? And they're currently striped blue, blue paint or blue tape. This, you mean what are they? What are they now? Right. I think the, I think they're blue, and I think they're when they want. And I, I believe, I mean, uh, for the for the uh, senior games is to try and make it pretty uniform throughout. You know, to to mirror other uh, pickleball courts. St standardize. Okay. Thank you. Any other updates? Yeah, Chair, the senior games are the um, the um, Memorial Day weekend. So the end of end of May. Thank you. And the I'll just add that the electric conveyances ad hoc had a kickoff meeting, our our first meeting as as an ad hoc group, and spent spent the, the time with really a framing discussion, uh, trying to narrow down what it is that we're looking for, looking to uh, make a policy recommendation on, uh, trying to put, put together some time frames and, and some constraints in terms of what we'll, what, what's uh, in our purview and what's uh, reasonable, realistic for us to aim for. And looking forward to uh, continuing meeting on that and, and uh, Darren is confident that uh, we can uh, get a policy recommendation uh, done this this calendar year. We're working to, working together with staff, so appreciate all of staff support on that. Any other ad hoc or liaison updates? I want to encourage all the ad hocs to try to uh, find a way to to meet next month in, in the coming month before our next meeting and. Uh, work to make some incremental in, incremental progress on the uh, goals and projects that we're aiming towards. Thank you. Uh, we're now ready to move on to our Save the Bay presentation. I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, and Darren, if you could please introduce our speaker. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's, it's my pleasure to introduce Jesse McKean Scott. She's the Restoration Manager, Program Manager with Save the Bay. And Jesse, if you are able to share your screen, that'd be great. And maybe while you're getting that ready, I'll just share just a little bit. Um, about 22 years ago, when I was a ranger at the Baylands, I was running different uh, habitat restoration projects myself. And I would do the best I could, but we didn't have a lot of resources or staff. And so I would reach out to the Boy Scouts or whomever and try to lead programs, usually removing invasive plants. And it was just difficult. There was, wasn't enough uh, resources to do it well. And someone from Save the Bay, a woman named Marilyn Ladder, reached out to me and said, hey, we'd love to partner with you. And that was the beginning of a 21-year relationship that has just been outstanding. I can't tell you how problem-free it has been and what a gift their expertise and resources have been to our operation 
to our goals of reaching habitat uh, improvements. It's just been outstanding, just a wonderful partner. And I'm again, really grateful for Jesse for being here tonight and, and sharing a little bit about the partnership and about Save the Bay. Thanks so much, Darren. And thank you for inviting us to be here tonight. Um, my name again is Jesse McKean-Scott and I'm the Restoration Program Manager here at Save the Bay. Save the Bay is the oldest and largest nonprofit organization working exclusively to celebrate, protect, and restore the San Francisco Bay. We were established in 1961, and we work on policy issues, education, and restoration around the Bay. We've partnered with the City of Palo Alto and the Palo Alto Baylands for the past 20 years to restore the wetland transition zone between the extensive marshes at the park. These ecotonal habitats are very important refuges for marsh dependent wildlife. They also provide buffers between critical infrastructure and rising sea levels. And of course, provide scenic natural areas for Bay Area residents to recreate and to connect to the Bay. So today I'm here to tell you a little bit more about the work that we do and the partnership that we've had for these last 20 years. As an entire organization, Save the Bay has a staff of around 25 people. And our habitat restoration team is made up of five full-time staff members, as well as some additional seasonal staff members, fellows, and super volunteers. The people you see here on the screen are our five full-time staff members, and it's very possible you might see us out in the fields, out in the Baylands. We want to encourage you, if you ever do see us out there doing work, to come up and ask questions, engage with us. We love uh, interacting with the public and answering any questions that you might have. The habitat restoration team has three key areas of focus where we're doing our work. Those three areas are mobilizing the public to help us restore transition zone habitat, educating community members, including the next generation of bay savers, and working with partners and land managers to contribute to large scale restoration efforts. A little bit of history about the San Francisco Bay in general. 90% uh, of tidal marshland has been lost in the San Francisco Bay. There are currently 80,000 acres that are protected, enhanced, or restored in some way, and a, an additional 30,000 acres that are planned for upcoming restoration. Our goal at Save the Bay is to help reestablish the tidal marsh ecotone to create habitat for bay wildlife and to help our communities adapt to sea level rise from climate change. Our habitat restoration work is located specifically within the transition zone, which is something that is fairly unique to Save the Bay. Um, and so that means that we're working adjacent to the tidal marsh, but we're not actually going into the tidal marsh. In the graphic that you see here on the screen, that means that we're working in the zone generally like the midpoint in the mid-level marsh, sort of where that marsh gum plant arrow ends about halfway through. Um, this zone provides a ton of really important, oops, sorry about that, a ton of really important ecosystem services. Uh, this is an area with a lot of rich species biodiversity. It's a very important habitat for endangered and endemic plant and animal species, including the salt marsh harvest mouse and the Ridgeways whale, rail. Uh, it's a buffer from upland anthropogenic inputs entering our waterways, as well as vice versa, protecting our communities from storm surges and rising sea levels. This is also an area that is a very important carbon sink. And when we are thinking about climate change and trapping carbon, uh, it, instead of having it go into the atmosphere, this is a really important space where that is happening. Um, and the reason that Save the Bay really focuses in this transition zone is to help kickstart the reestablishment of this habitat. This is a process that on its own might take 10 to 15 years, but with our help, we can speed up that process to have the transition zone reestablished in three to five years and kind of doing its thing on its own. Um, and we think when we think about just the, the speed at which um, climate change is impacting um, bayside communities and where our sea levels are rising, uh, speeding up that process is a really important thing to do. 
but what are we actually doing? <laughs> well, um, our habitat rest restoration work is very highly seasonal. And in that sense, it is fairly predictable. So we just finished up our winter outplanting season where this season we planted 30 to 40,000 container plants at our different sites around the Bay. We direct sowed native seed and we also experimented with some farming equipment to distribute rhizomatous plant material into those transition zones. We're now sort of transitioning into our spring season where we're focused on, focusing on sowing seeds and transplanting in our nurseries. And then out in the field, we are doing a ton of weeding to knock down some of that mustard that's going to seed and other plants like that. And of course, alongside this restoration work, we're also providing public programming, which we'll dive into a little bit more in some of these later slides. Um, so we actually have seven restoration sites around the Bay that our restoration team is working at. Five of those sites are, include nursery sites as well as general site work. And we've worked at the Martin Luther King Jr. shoreline, which is part of the East Bay Regional Parks District, as well as the Palo Alto Baylands for nearly 20 years. These sites are primarily used to engage the public, student and corporate groups through our on-site and nursery programs. We also have taken on some larger scale transition zone restoration projects after a very successful completion of the Oraloma Horizontal Levy Demonstration Project, uh, or the Oraloma Project being in the East Bay over in San Lorenzo. Some of these newer projects that we're working on have included work at Eden Landing in Hayward, as well as uh, a large seasonal wetland complex of 42 acres up in Belmoran Keys in the North Bay. Um, and then two sites down in the South Bay Salt Pond levee projects down here at Ravenswood. Uh, and we're, we're really happy to be out at these different sites and doing the work as well as being able to engage students in these spaces. But of course, we're here <laughs> with the Palo Alto Parks and Recreation Commission. And so I want to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the upcoming work that we're planning for the Palo Alto Baylands starting this year. So to kind of give you a sense overall of where we're looking and where we're doing this site work, of course, you know, here we have the Palo Alto Duck Pond and Ranger Station um, just up above the pin for the Palo Alto Duck Pond is where our um, nursery is. One of our container plant nurseries is right here. And then these orange boxes on this Google map image here represent our two upcoming sites that we'll be focusing on in the coming year for restoration work. This is the entry lot site and the nature center or Monday lot site that we'll be focusing on. So looking first at this entry lot site, the boundaries of the area that we are working on are here outlined in red. This is a 1400 meter square site that is currently characterized by large patches of the invasive shrub Italian buckthorn, as well as the locally introduced big salt bush. Um, with grassy clearings of non-native annual grasses and perennial smilo grass also spread throughout this area. And you can see on the right here, some current and before pictures of what the site is looking like. Our restoration goals for this site include removing that Italian buckthorn and the big salt bush, which currently are obstructing the view of the marsh from the parking lot. And instead we'll be revegetating the site with a diverse suite of locally sourced native plants that are adapted to the site conditions and that will provide both a beautiful experience for park visitors, as well as that really critical habitat for wildlife in the park. The nature center lot um, over by the nature center is actually divided into two sections. And so the Southern section totals around 1400 meters squared, similar in size to that entry lot site. And then the Northern section is approximately 650 meters squared. Our restoration goals for this site are very much the same as the entry lot, but we also have the increased opportunity at this site to experiment with some more wetland species in the swale in this bottom picture here on the right that is just below the parking lot. 
So we're really excited to have the opportunity to work at these two new sites and do some restoration there. Um, and in the next few months, when you see us out at the Baylands, uh, what might you see us be doing? So let's dive into that a little bit more. A big part of our work, and again, this is mostly happening in the fall and winter, are our team planting days. This is when we're taking the 30 to 40,000 container plants that we're growing in the nursery, some on site at the Palo Alto nursery, and we are going out into the field and planting all these plants. You can see some of our staff here on the right out there. These little yellow containers are called stubs, and um, we're taking those, taking the plants out of the stubs and putting them into the ground where they can grow up uh, and fill in the site. You may also see us monitoring. This happens especially in the spring and in the early fall. Um, monitoring is a really important part of our work. Here on the left, you can see a picture of one of our sites out at Eden Landing before we had done any work. And again, just a few years later, um, when the site has been filled in, those plants have really had a chance to grow up uh, and reestablish in that transition zone. Monitoring is important in part of our work so that not only can we just look at this and say, wow, look at all the plants that are here, but we can really uh, gauge the success of new restoration techniques, as well as identify whether we're hitting certain goals around native plant cover versus non-native plant cover and things like that. As we're doing this work, we're also coming up with a lot of questions for ourselves to answer. We might wanna know what plant species are actually found in the transition zone and at what abundance, or how many plant species are found in the transition zone? What's our species richness? Uh, and by monitoring these sites over time, over multiple years, we're really able to gauge the success and understand the answers to these questions. And another thing that you'll see happening a lot out at the Baylands in the coming weeks, months, we have a program actually on Thursday out at the Baylands with some students, uh, is running these education programs and community programs. So in a non-COVID year, we would bring up to 2,700 students out to the shoreline for our free service learning programs. These learning programs include educational curriculum as well as hands-on restoration work. And while we are not quite up to the level of like in-person program participation that we were pre-pandemic, we are really happy that we're able to welcome students to the shoreline again and work with them in the field. We have also connected with a larger audience through our new online platform, which is called Outdoor Learning Online or OLO. And um, as with many organizations during the pandemic, we pivoted to this online interface in 2020, of course, due to COVID restrictions. Um, and we're hoping that this portal will be a really important space to enrich our on-site programming and engage with a wider student audience. Um, so again, I want to just say that we're so grateful for the partnership we've had at the Palo Alto Baylands and with the city of Palo Alto for the last 20 years. It's really allowed us to do such important work. Uh, and I wanna thank you again for inviting me to join this conversation today and open the floor to any questions if we have time. Thank, thank you so much for the presentation, Jesse. It was very uh, enlightening. I, I personally hear, hear, we hear about Save the Bay and don't really uh, have a, a lot of uh, specifics and faces to, to connect with it. And this is really helpful to the commission. Uh, do any commissioners, uh, actually, first, let me see if there's any members of the public who would like to speak on this item. If anybody would like to speak, uh, please raise your hand now. And I don't see any one with their hand raised. So we'll go to uh, commissioners' uh, questions, comments. Uh, Ellis? Yeah, um, very impressive uh, uh, presentation. Really appreciate that. I have probably about three or four questions to. Uh, ask you, but as you did your presentation, you pretty much uh, answered all the questions. One of the, one of the ones I had was, um, I imagine you get a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of people out there helping you guys out. And you mentioned that you have 27 students. And I, so I imagine you're reaching out to 
the local colleges and universities and schools uh, for that, um, for that uh, assistance. And the fact that it takes, I guess, a number of years from the time that you actually start your work to the time that you actually see uh, progress, I, I imagine that's pretty impressive as well. So how, you, you mentioned monitoring. Are there any special tools that you're using uh, for that purpose? Yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to monitoring, we are usually visiting a site um, over a course of three to five years to really measure that progress. And that depends on specific contracts or grants that we are doing on that work and how long uh, we want to monitor. As far as specific tools, you know, um, we have very specific protocols, but the actual tools to do the work are not so wild. We have you know, meter tapes and we have elevation um, measurement tools so that we make sure we're measuring at the right light, right uh, height or elevation and the same across a transition zone habitat. Um, but otherwise, when we get out there, we are using um, Fulcrum, which is a data app to track our data over time. Um, but then also we're just really getting out there with some PVC quadrats and saying, okay, look in this spot, what plants do you see? Let's identify them together. Let's measure them with a tape measure um, and uh, see what we find and see how that changes over time. So the equipment isn't so, so wild um, and it just is a little bit of training to get everyone up on the same page and make sure we are monitoring in the same way and identifying the species correctly. Andy? It's a lot of work to do with five full-time staff, so I'm very impressed and uh, keep up the great work. Um, and uh, we thank you for your partnership with the city. Thank you. Shani? Thank you for your work. I have some questions. And if you go back to the slide that showed the restoration sites that you're looking at, difficulties always. Yeah. Uh, no, but the Palo Alto ones, not this one. Oh, yes. Okay. So back one, one slide. Yeah. Is there any conflict between the site, any of these sites to the um, Palo Alto Horizontal Levy Project? Not that we're aware of, but yeah, happy to hear from the commission as well. But we've been working with the rangers um, at the Palo Alto Bayland specifically to select these sites. Okay. Um, because I think one is pretty close. So you might wanna check that there is no overlap or some problems because of that other project for this project. Um, another question I had was, why are you removing the salt bush? Totally, so those species um, are partially, it's partially it's to create a uh, safer space for members of the public who are using that parking lot. These bushes grow really large in that space. And we want the public, members of the public to feel safe and feel like they have a clear view of the marsh and the area when they're recreating in that space. Um, and because these species are very good at growing quickly and taking over a large amount of space, it makes it difficult for other native species to compete in that area. So we won't be coming in and like massively removing all of these species at once. We're going to be very selective about how we do so and pay really close attention to, um, you know, impacts on people and wildlife. Um, but those are some of the reasons that that's. Uh, I have a strong uh, feeling about that. I think that this is a native plant. It grows there. And if it hides the bay, uh, then plant it, plant it somewhere else before you remove these and let it grow. I don't see why we would remove habitat, an important habitat. They're not all over the place, those salt bush plants. They're in that area. And so I have 
strong reservation about removing habitat. And I don't think people feel unsafe. I, I don't know, it seems like an assumption to me. So I think, <laughs> I'm not sure this is a, you know, I understand that you want to remove the buckthorn, that's not a native species, but the salt plant, the salt bush is. And atriplex used to be a lot more of it than there is now. So that's of concern to me. Um, my next question is about, you said do you collect a lot of information, biological information, is that available to the public? Um, you know what, I think we do release some of our information, but most of the data and we present information in uh, to members of the public in certain presentations. Uh, I'm not actually sure I'm fairly new to the organization and so I'm not 100% sure how all of that data has been presented in the past, other than, um, you know, coming to speak at different events. Um, but that is something that I could definitely get back to you on. I think using iNaturalist or some other similar system so people can see what is there, what was there, having a public um, transparency about the information that you're collecting. To me, that's important. Um, my last, and so maybe you can put it on iNat or something. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is about emerging invasive species. Do you have any monitoring for species that are coming in and maybe they're not in large populations yet, but they're expanding and they're invasive. Do you have any attention to that? Yes, so when we do our monitoring, we're monitoring not only for the specific native species that we've planted, but generally looking at uh, what invasive species or what other species are coming in and establishing in an area uh, and definitely paying attention to that and then um, as we see populations of invasives expanding, we're able to uh, target those species when we are coming out and doing our weeding projects and, and things like that on site. Okay, that's great. And also maybe if you put those on INAT, it might help other people find out and identify things that we don't all have an easy time identifying. Um, so those are my questions. Back to the salt bush. I think we have so little vegetation that removing a very nice stand of an important native species may we want to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on, Darren, could you comment on what the, the oversight process is for work that Save the Bay is doing and how their their projects are presented and approved by this. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, typically, it's a hand in hand with the supervising ranger at the site. So that's Lisa Myers, who works there. And she's the one who would do a lot of the coordination, although Save the Bay is probably so integrated with these other projects, they some level of the organization is already tied to things like the horizontal levy, but where they aren't, their conduit would be that supervising ranger who's tied into those. So the Tidegate project, the horizontal levy, those kind of things, Lisa is serving as the nexus point to make sure we're in, in cooperation and coordination and tying in with other organizations like the EVs who are right there on site too. Um, so that's predominantly supervising ranger working closely with them. And just to clarify as well, we will not be um, we will not be coming in and removing all of the salt bush, um, but just in small areas, uh, stemming back some of that, um, just so that there is more uh, species biodiversity in that area. If you look at one of the sites, it is pretty much entirely that salt bush, and so we won't be removing it all. It'll just be to promote increased species richness and biodiversity there. Uh, I understand. From an ecological point of view, large stands of a native plant provide a lot more for pollinators and other um, wildlife that use it. And actually patch size matters ecologically. So when you say, oh, I want more diversity in my one spot, that may actually reduce the value of that spot. And so, you know, unfortunately for this, I'm an ecologist and I've done some research on these things. So I don't necessarily believe that you have to diversify every spot. And when you have a plant that is part of the Baylands historical and ecological system that is thriving, then 
take a look before you start, um, I don't know, look at all the species that it brings with it, what species eat it, what species hide in it, and how, you know, remove, removing some of it and diversifying that specific spot can impact those species. We are impacting our ecosystem so much that restoration projects should be very, very careful not to actually remove habitat or degrade it in any way. So this is what I have to say about it. And maybe you can look at it there. And I, I, I just think this is one of the species that we try to plant in different places to on campuses in Bayview over at Moffitt. We're trying to plant Atriplex because it brings so much with it. So I, I don't know if you're going to remove it here, then make a nice stand somewhere else. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Kleinhaus. I'll, I'll just did when I was a ranger at the Baylands. We had so many areas that were just barren or completely dominated, 100% with invasive weeds. And the partnership with Save the Bay was just starting and focused on one area. And I looked at those dominant plant species. So it was things like coyote bush, other native that some agencies, including Fish and Wildlife Service, where it becomes such a monoculture, would remove it. And when I learned about that, I thought, why? It's a native, it's good habitat. And in certain situations, I planted hundreds of coyote bush and they filled in those barren areas. And I think it made a lot of sense. Likewise, likewise with the Atroplex, there was areas where strategically it made so much more sense to have that than take it out and run the risk of some invasive taking it unless you can replant it really well like Save the Bay. But I, I, your point is taken. I think it's a good thing for us to keep an eye on. And if there's an adjacent area that's barren, maybe that should be the first focus for, for some of those plantings. But um, I also have a lot of faith in Save the Bay and trust in them as well. But I think we can discuss that with them and see if there's a, a happy meeting we can reach and figure out something there. I also wanted, if, I, if you don't mind, Chair, just a, a quick comment. Um, one, she touched on so many great things that Save the Bay has done and is doing. But one I wanted to share is that the effect they have on our youth, regionally and our Palo youth. So just this one little story I'll share. In the beginning, I would often join them on their programs. My goodness, what a difference between the city run, ranger run program and Save the Bay. They really set the, the example of how to inspire people to care. And this one really blew me away. We were planting some native plants and at the end of the plant day, it was like three hours of hard work. And these kids each had a small water bottle and rather than drink it, they were pouring out the last of their drinking water to water their newly planted plants. And I just thought, wow, this is a future environmental steward that you've just created by teaching them about this and having them take part in every phase of the restoration process, litter and trash removal, as well as invasive species removal, growing the seeds in our native plant nursery and collecting them and then replanting mountain field. It was just tremendous. So I just wanted to close the staff comments with a big thank you to Save the Bay and acknowledge the impact it had on our community and our youth. Thank you. Commissioner Cribbs. Um, no, I have very little to say about this except for I love the program and have been aware of it for a really long time. So thank you, Jesse, for everything you and, and your team has done. I would just wonder if there's anything that you would like um, to in addition to what the city does already and what Darren's team does um, that the commission could do um, for you and for Save the Bay. Thank you so much. That's a really great question and I probably have to think about it a little bit more. You all have please, been, you know, so it's been such a wonderful partnership and really um, the, the team and the, the rangers at the park have been so helpful and uh, really there to answer any questions and to be there for us and we're really really grateful for everything that you've all done and I'll think on it and maybe get back to you. <laughs> Great. That'd be terrific. I'll look forward to it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation and the tremendous work you do and getting so many youth involved is is, is wonderful. Um, a couple quick questions and some of these may be able to be might be more directed towards Darren. Um, what is the relationship it, financial relationship between us and Save the Bay? Like what, how do we work with them um, and, and what's the process of, of funding? And I, I'm sure they do fundraising as well, but what's the city portion of what- yeah, There isn't them? a financial relationship. It's mutual exchange of, of the Rangers supporting them wherever we can. It used to be that they would leave bags of the invasive species out on the 
on the levees or wherever they were working and the rangers would come and that would be kind of our role to help with that. But um, they just give us tremendous amount of support and there isn't a financial uh, reimbursement for it. And so how do you guys, what, how do you do your fundraising? It's through grants and then other, other fundraising, is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. So we're a nonprofit organization, so we are very much largely funded by grants um, and you know private donors. Specifically, some of the work or some of the funding for this work just comes from uh, you know when we lead when we lead programs with corporate groups, they pay to participate in volunteer work, and some of that funding goes to work that we're doing out at the Palo Alto Baylands. We also just got a large um, donation from Salesforce, who is funding, therefore, some of that work, uh, as well as some work at some of our other sites as well, which is a large grant that just came in. And then where is your nursery located? Is that yeah, so, in the Baylands or where, how does that work? Yes. So one of our nurseries is located at the Palo Alto Baylands. We have five nurseries uh, kind of spread around the bay, but one of our container plant nurseries is there just off the duck pond, um, kind of behind a fence in with other ranger station supplies and things. And then uh, last is, do you guys ever put a number or monetize the amount of work that you do uh, to benefit the Baylands and to benefit Palo Alto? I just think it would be interesting to hear a number or see a number of all the man hours and uh, person hours rather and all the container plants and so forth and everything that you're doing that is such a benefit uh, to the whole community and, and to the entire Bay. But thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, a, a great line of, of questioning there and, and probably something that would be good to include in future presentations to, to point out that the, the, the financial arrangement is uh, all, all uh, that there's nothing coming from the, from the city for all the, the great uh, work that you're doing for our community. That, that's awesome. I, I wanna say, first of all, uh, th thank you for the, the presentation again. Um, I'm very excited to learn that that about your nursery. I, during a, a less enlightened time when I used to take my kids to the duck pond to throw uh, bread in, into the pond, kind of always wondered what that uh, that area with the, the, the all the plants growing was. So, and now it's good to connect the dots. Uh, I'm wondering what percentage of the work that Save the Bay does is at, at the Palo Alto Baylands ballpark? That's a great question. I would say ballpark, probably around 25%. Um, and that number will maybe be going up a little bit as we really dive into some of these new sites. Um, but yeah, I'd say we are, you know, at the nursery as a staff at least once a week um, and then kind of sprinkled throughout additional times throughout the week as well. Thank you. And as Commissioner Brown noted, all this work done with five full-time employees is, is really incredible. Has your staffing, your full-time staff level fluctuated uh, much during COVID and uh, or, or in general? Yeah, we're, we're looking to the future, especially as we kick off new programs and really bring students back into the field and are, are starting to look at, you know, maybe bringing a few more folks onto the team. Um, during COVID, I think we, we maintained about five uh, staff members throughout, throughout that period. In the wintertime, we do hire a couple additional staff. So we had two um, seasonal staff that were working only in the field to help us plant these like massive numbers of plants. Um, and so that has been a big part of it. And then we also, I really wanna acknowledge our super volunteers. These are folks who have been coming out just to volunteer with us on a really regular basis. Uh, some have been, many have been with the organization longer than some of our staff. Uh, and so we really also rely on their support to help us uh, expand our impact as well. Great, thank you. Uh, regarding the sites uh, that you mentioned, they're both near parking lots. Uh, the, the sites in the Baylands where you'll be working uh, in the near future. Do you expect foot traffic through these areas? Um, and, and if so, how are you accommodating that or how are you trying to, to prevent that? And how does that affect what, what you're choosing to put in the area? 
Yeah, that's a really great question. And a lot of these areas have trails that run right alongside them. And so, uh, you know, I don't know that I expect a lot of increased foot traffic in the area um, because hopefully people will be sticking to the paths. But with certain species or as they're getting established, you know, it's possible that we might um, put some markers or flagging tape around or not flagging tape, but flags around some of these new plants just so, so that people are more aware of them uh, and pay a little bit more attention um, when they're wandering through. But again, hopefully they're mostly staying on the pavement. There's not a lot of uh, reason to go off these paths in many cases because there's already uh, trails kind of right alongside where we'll be planting. Great, Th thank you. And, and last question, could you say a little bit more about the, the major partners that you work with? And are, are you working with San Francisco Estuary Institute and what, what is your role in the horizontal levy project uh, uh, that's being proposed for this area? Absolutely, yeah. So we have a lot of partners. Uh, we are part of that Estuary Institute we, um, we also partner with the East Bay Regional Parks District. We partner with the Nevada Bayland Stewards um, and are just generally part of many of the larger organizations working um, to protect the estuary. Our policy team also does a lot of um, collaboration with other organizations to, to advance the work that we are doing. Um, and can you repeat the second part of your question again? Uh, oh, the horizontal levy. Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, so we are part of that. And um, again, I wish I could speak more to that. I came on board recently and I haven't been entirely introduced to that, but I know that it is something that we are involved in. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, do any commission members have any follow-up questions or staff uh, questions or comments? Well, Jesse, I wanna thank you for, for joining us and presenting uh, to us, uh, it'd be great to have Save the Bay, uh, have a back for a return visit in a year or two's time to get an update. And uh, we really appreciate the, all the work that your organization does for our community. And thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you all so much for having me. Okay. Our next item is the review of the proposed updates to the city's tree protection ordinance. And th this is a, an item that is looking at proposed changes to title eight of the municipal code, which is officially called trees and vegetation is more commonly, often commonly known as the tree protection ordinance. We'll start off with the, the staff presentation and then we'll briefly go to question, uh, clarifying questions that commission members have uh, and followed by an opportunity for public comment. Uh, and so if, you, if any members of the public would like to speak, please make sure you've filled out a speaker card or raise your hand. And we'll look to have three minutes uh, per speaker unless we get uh, an unwieldy number uh, looking to speak. Uh, and then after public comment, we'll come back for commission comments. Uh, I just, so with, with that, Darren, would you like to introduce our uh, speaker, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. My pleasure to introduce Peter Gollinger. He's the acting urban forester with the Public Works Department. Thank you for being here tonight, Peter. And thank you for that. Darren, let me try and get my presentation mode going here. Excellent. Uh, so thank you, Darren, and thank you, Chair Greenfield and commissioners. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about our proposed changes to our Palo Alto Title VIII Tree, Ordin tree Protection Ordinance. Um, so we're going to share some of the progress we've made and hopefully answer any of the questions that you might have. So why are we doing this update? So the ordinance was first passed in 1951 and the last uh, major update was in 1996. And we've had some new uh, city policy documents that have been adopted since the last update, but they're not yet backed by municipal code. There's also been some new state legislation that has uh, taken place since the last major update. And this includes the Model Water Efficiency Landscape Ordinance and some new regulations around wildfire prevention. 
In addition, there's been uh, numerous recent studies that have expanded upon the benefits that are provided by the urban forest, and they're much greater than we had previously thought. So here's a timeline of the historical updates for Title VIII. Um, we were ahead of the curve here in Palo Alto, as with most things. Uh, we adopted the tree ordinance in 1951 to protect uh, city trees. In 1996, oaks were included as protected species. And in 99, the addition of the preservation and management guidelines for uh, private trees were enacted. Redwoods were added in 2001. And in 2011, we changed the, we updated the tree removal requirements for the hospital district. So one of the policy documents that is affected, um, that has been adopted since the last update is the urban forest master plan. Uh, there are some specific goals in the master plan related to the ordinance. Uh, they are, some of them are, achieve greater percentage of native drought tolerant species, ensure that there's a no net loss of benefits during development, um, increase habitat, health, and social benefits, strive for no net loss of canopy, and increase canopy cover. Additionally, the 2030 comprehensive plan was adopted since our last update. And there are several goals and key actions that are related to the ordinance in the comprehensive plan. Um, and there's also some in other chapters besides the natural environment. Uh, the urban forest plays uh, a role in a lot of portions of the comprehensive plan. Um, primarily, the key ones are improve the overall distribution of citywide canopy cover, periodically update the tree ordinance, and strive towards the aspirational long-term goal of achieving 50% canopy cover across the city. Additionally, the Sustainability and Climate Action Plan that it is currently in process um, has a lot of goals and key actions related to the urban forest as well. Um, one of them is increase tree canopy to 40% by 2030 and ensure no net loss of tree canopy for all projects. The state laws that I referenced earlier are Executive Order B-2915, which is the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance that um, basically ensures that large landscape projects are uh, water wise and water efficient. They have to follow a water budget and submit landscape plans uh, to be approved. Also SB-247, the Dodd Wildfire Prevention Bill, uh, put some additional restrictions on vegetation management for fire prevention. So most of you, I'm sure, are well aware of uh, the benefits of the urban forest. Um, here are just some of the benefits that have been um, talked about and recent studies have shown that some of these benefits are even greater than we had originally uh, talked about. I actually saw a recent article that equated canopy cover to prescription of antidepressants and that the higher the canopy cover, the less prescriptions were written, which was fascinating. There's a lot of good health data out there tied to canopy cover. As far as quantifiable benefits, uh, depending on the total number of trees that you calculate in the urban forest, we don't have an accurate inventory, so we have to estimate. Um, 29 to 49,000 tons of CO2 are sequestered annually. Almost a million gallons of stormwater are diverted away from the storm drains. That's assuming a regular rain year, of course. Um, almost 300,000 pounds of air pollutants are removed. And almost 84 million kilowatts of energy are saved, kilowatt hours. So what are some of the details to the changes that we're proposing? So the proposed changes can be categorized into three main sections. Um, updates to list of authorized officers and relevant staff positions. Many of the positions involved with the yeah. um, maintenance of the ordinance and enforcement of the ordinance were not in existence when the ordinance was written. Um, we are restructuring some of the chapters and sections to increase clarity and document flow. And we have some substantive changes to align the ordinance with the existing policies and state laws that we talked about. And those are the uh, changes I'm gonna be focusing on in the following slides. Tree permits. So permits for work on public trees. These are permits that a resident would 
apply for to do work on a city owned tree. Um, often this happens if a resident uh, re would like to have more frequent pruning than is provided by the city's seven year cycle, or it could be work on a tree that's in conjunction with a development project and they need permission for that. So we have streamlined the process and clarified the reasons for and, and how to do it in these sections of the ordinance. There's two sections that focus on enforcement, one enforcement for uh, public trees and one enforcement for private trees. And these sections have been updated to clarify what types of penalties can be applied and the list of employees that are authorized to issue violations. The main types of penalties that are used are administrative penalties, which are um, handled through the city's administrative penalty schedule and process, civil penalties, which would be handled in a court of law, and stop work actions or development moratoriums, which are handled through the development process. One big change that we're proposing is a designated arborist system. This would be basically the city would create a list of qualified, certified, and selected arborists that an applicant could then choose to hire to complete any documents relating to their application. So the main things that would need to be filled out by a designated arborist would be the tree disclosure statement that accompanies an application for development, tree preservation reports, hazard assessments, or other arborist, re or other arborist reports. Our current draft specifies that applicants would select and hire from the list on their own, unless the project was a project that automatically um, triggered a hearing, in which case the city would reserve the right to select an arborist that uh, would be appropriate for that project. Menlo Park has a similar um, program and we would probably model our selection process off of that. Um, ideally, we would have a set of uh, very clear, concise standards that a, an arborist would need to meet to be on the list and that would avoid any preferential treatment of any arborist. Excessive pruning. So the definition and um, of excessive pruning has been expanded in the proposed draft. The current definition does not include roots. So we have included roots into the standard 25% definition, meaning if 25% of the tree was removed during a specific period of time, the current ordinance is 12 months and we are proposing to revise the time window to 36 months. So if 25% of any portion of a tree were removed within 36 month period, it could be a violation of excessive pruning. Additionally, oaks have been separated out of the main definition and now pruning of 15% or more is considered excessive for oak species. This is to ensure that we don't um, damage the uh, root systems of our native oaks. Protected trees. This is where we have some of our biggest changes. Uh, we have proposed to add several additional native species to be protected at 11.5 inches, which is our current threshold for valley oaks and live oaks. Additionally, we would be adding big leaf maples, incense cedars, blue oaks, and California black oaks. And under the new proposal, all other species would be protected at 15 inches, with the exception of invasive species that would be listed on the Cal IPC list and high water users on the water use classification of landscape species list, which is run by the Department of Water Resources and the UC system. So you'll notice here that actually redwoods would be the least protected of all of our protected species. Um, and this is a big change and puts us more in line with some of our neighboring municipalities. Other protected tree categories, most of these are in existence currently. Any tree designated for protection during review and approval of a development project, any tree designated for carbon sequestration and storage or environmental mitigation purposes, and any replacement mitigation tree or other tree designated to be planted due to the conditions in the ordinance. So this in essence protects replacement trees that are planted when a protected tree is removed. Additionally, one of the key one of the key pieces of our current ordinance process is the tree technical manual. 
And this is basically the tree Bible for anybody who is working with development or protected trees within the city. And our new ordinance would be supported by an updated manual, which would be called the tree and landscape technical manual. We would need to add the addition of landscape to cover some of the MWILO requirements. Uh, specifications within the manual will include a prioritization of the use of locally native species, the inclusion of climate adaptive and drought tolerant species as a secondary priority, and the additional goal of net tree canopy increase on the property within 15 years. Landscape design, irrigation, and installation standards will also be included. Updates to the prohibited acts section. So this section has been reorganized into several categories to discuss when a protected tree may, may be removed under certain situations. Uh, the categories are outside of the development process, as part of development on a residential lot, as part of a project with a subdivision of land, as part of any other project requiring discretionary approval by the city, and then any other circumstances other than those listed above. The intent was to clarify the current ordinance is all of these are kind of lumped together into one section. So separating these out um, should help clarify things for applicants. So allowable reasons for removal outside the development process. Uh, the tree is dead, hazardous, or a nuisance. The tree is a detriment to or is crowding an adjacent protected tree or is impacting the foundation or eaves of a primary residence. So trees removed under this category may trigger a 36 month development moratorium and mitigation measures could be, uh, would be required to lift the moratorium early. Uh, this is to prevent a loophole where a dead or dying tree can be removed uh, with just a um, tree permit. And then the applicant could turn around and immediately apply for a development permit. That is the current situation. So this would ensure that um, any tree removals would be considered as part of the development permit, which is the preferred method. Allowable reasons for removal as part of development on a residential lot. So again, the tree is dead, hazardous, or a nuisance. Um, the tree is a detriment to or crowding an adjacent protected tree or is impacting the foundation or eaves of the residence. And then the new one is the new category here is intended to capture some of the um, language from the previous ordinance, but clarify it. The tree is so close to the proposed development that construction would result in the death of the tree. And there is no financially feasible and reasonable design alternative that would permit the preservation of the tree. Allowable reasons for a project that has a subdivision of land, the tree is dead, hazardous or a nuisance and removal is unavoidable due to restricted access or it's deemed necessary to repair a geologic hazard. For most other projects would fall under this category, which would be a project requiring discretionary approval by the city. Uh, this is where the 25% rule that we have currently um, comes into play. Here we have added the, spe the specification that no financially feasible and reasonable design alternative is available that would permit the preservation of the tree. Additionally, the tree could be removed because it's dead, hazardous, or a nuisance. And in such cases, uh, equal area of the drip line would need to be uh, preserved for mitigation. So that's not the exact uh, outline of the tree. It's an area equal to the canopy of the tree needs to be preserved so that uh, mitigation plantings can be planted. Changes to care of protected trees. So the list of actions that may negatively impact protected trees has been expanded to include some other items such as underwatering. Um, and we have added a requirement for owners of protected trees to notify the city and publicly post their intent to maintain their tree. So any major um, pruning. Uh, this is to educate your neighbors and the public and prevent panicked calls from uh, from residents that are, are worried that a tree is being removed when in fact it's being uh, pruned for maintenance. Um, additionally, um, owners would have to um, verify that they're going to follow uh, best management practices in hiring an arborist and doing this work. So it's it's an educational portion as well. It's educating the owners as to the proper maintenance of the tree and notifying the neighbors that the work is gonna happen. 
tree removal in the wildland urban interface area. So the WUI, as it's known, is in Palo Alto, it is pretty much everything uh, south and west of 280, roughly. And uh, this is considered a higher fire danger zone. And due to that, um, we've chosen to have any um, issues that come up in that area to be uh, ruled by the uh, fire ordinances. We plan to uh, provide an additional update to the tree ordinance in the future that has a separate set of rules for dealing with protected trees in the, in the wildland urban interface. But we felt that it was more important to um, have the rest of the ordinance go before council now, and we'll work on this more thoughtfully and make sure that it's um, well prepared. In the meantime, if there's a conflict, the fire regulations trump the Title VIII. Uh, we have also made some changes to applications, notices, and appeals to try and streamline the language and make it um, increase the clarity of the process. Um, in addition, we've added some additional notification requirements for um, protected tree applications, removal applications. These include posting on the property on the city website and by mail to addresses within 600 feet. And it also requires notice when applying for a permit and when a decision is made. Um, and it also includes an appeals process um, that's, the draft has the exact process used in chapter 18, um, 0.78. And we may modify that and include an appeals process that's based on chapter 1878, but stays inside of public works as opposed to the development center. Um, that's something that we're still working on. So summary of the potential impacts to residents, um, changes that may cause the most impact would be having to file for a protected tree removal permit to remove trees that were previously unprotected. And the reason you wanna remove it, you must qualify in order to get removal. It's not just granted, you must meet the removal guidelines. Uh, the new requirement about notifying neighbors and the city before maintenance we expect that a lot more applications will be submitted for development projects that are going to require an arborist report where previously they would not. And tree disclosure statements and arborist reports must be completed by a designated arborist where currently the architect or the homeowner could complete the tree disclosure statement and then it would be reviewed by city staff. Uh, now it's going to need to be filled out by a designated arborist. So additional engagement, um, after this meeting, we will continue to work on the ordinance and we will be presenting it um, most likely at the first meeting in June to the council. And if all goes well, we will proceed from there. And I'd be happy to take any questions um, once we've... I believe uh, Chairman said that we would be taking comments first before questions. Is that correct? We'll, we'll do some, uh, if, if any commission members have clarifying questions, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through that first. I wanna, I wanna thank you for the, the presentation. This, this is a major, very detailed, comprehensive change as, as would be fit to, for a policy that hasn't been updated in, in 20 years. For full transparency, I wanna, say that I, I mentioned that I am a, an advisor to Canopy and I've also been working as part of a resident ad hoc group on reviewing and recommend, re recommending updates to the ordinance in conjunction with Canopy uh, with and staff and subject matter experts, including our former urban forester or former city arborist and uh, consultants in the field. Uh, I wanna point out this is a discussion item or a study session, so there will be no action taken this evening. Uh, before we proceed further, uh, if there's any members of the public uh, connected via Zoom who would like to speak, uh, please raise your hand. I know we have some cards. I don't see any uh, hands up from, from the external group. Thank you. Uh, as Peter mentioned, uh, last October's city council or it's included in the, in the staff report. Last October, City Council reviewed the recommended changes to the ordinance and directed staff to conduct further public outreach. This 
item at PRC this evening is part of this public outreach. Uh, also at the city council uh, meeting in October, uh, staff directed or council directed staff to formalize the relationship between our commission and the urban forestry section. So we now have a formal role as the community forum for urban forestry issues. And that includes review and recommendation on policy updates. Uh, our commission normally considers parks and open space uh, areas. And so Peter, I'd like to start by asking you to clarify the, the scope of the ordinance with respect to open space areas so we can keep that in mind. Yes, so um, as far as parks go, anything down here that is outside of the wildland urban interface would be handled um, just like other parts of the ordinance. Um, we have historically held uh, city projects that are run by urban forestry or utilities or any other department to the same standards as we have in the ordinance. Um, and that we plan on having that continue. These include <laughs> replanting requirements, posting requirements, et cetera. As far as the open space goes, because um, the majority of our um, open space with the exception of the Baylands is in the high fire danger zone, I, I think that's more of a, the fire regulations would trump tree preservation. So if we had a protected tree that needed to be um, removed due to fire clearance requirements, then that would be allowed. So, as a generalization, we're we're talking about everything that is uh, that is east of 280. Correct. Or uh, yeah, more, more, more give or take. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, now, do any other commission members have any questions before we go to members of the public, or or you can save it for, I have a for comments later? Yes, Shani. Um, you discuss uh, building permits and demolition is where in the process is um, grading permit. And is that included in demolition or is that before or after um, building permit, where does it go? So it's rare that we have a grading permit that is not part of a larger project. And so that would be part of, the, the way it would be handled would be as part of the larger project. So if it was a project that required discretionary review from planning, then it would be handled with those requirements. If it was a residential project, then it would be handled by those requirements. Um, but I, I would believe that it would be, it would fall into the category of the overall project. Uh, it's very rare we have a grading permit that's just a grading permit in and of itself. Usually it's a, a part of a larger project. I would include grading in the document. Specifically, I've seen grading permits that were provided not in Palo Alto ended up with no trees and no buildings, just graded area. And that's definitely something that we can look into. I know that we require uh, tree fencing inspection before anything is done, including grading or trenching or, or any other part of a project. So um, that's definitely something we can look into adding. Any other clarifying questions? Nellis? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, good presentation. Uh, I, I just have one, one quick one. Uh, it's been over 20 years since there's been a change. Um, have you put any thought? I mean, there's a lot of tree cutting that goes on in, in Palo Alto as far as um, communications once this is implemented. Uh, to um, you know, lands uh, people who are doing the uh, tree cutting and so forth. But what, what type of communications would go to them? And uh, when you talk about enforcement, uh, what level of enforcement would take place with that? That's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we do have uh, an outreach plan. <clears throat> excuse me. We do have an outreach plan in place, and uh, a lot of that. Uh, heavy lifting would be done by our uh, nonprofit partner Canopy. Um, and we've also uh, begun discussions about a uh, phased in approach as far as enforcement, meaning once the ordinance goes, ordinance goes into effect, all the protection measures are, are there, 
but perhaps we we allow a little bit of time before we uh, are writing violations for lack of posting for maintenance. That's that's a big change, and so that's going to require some uh, some education and some outreach to not only the residents but the the tree companies as well. Um, I think one thing we can agree on is that the protections for the additional species would need to be in place from the moment it goes into effect. Um, and, but maybe some of those other issues like the designated arborist list will take us some time to establish. So perhaps we don't put that uh, into effect for the first few months until that gets up and running. Uh, so we have talked about that and thought about that and um, we'll make a proposal when we come before council for what we recommend as far as the implementation. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Yes, yeah, Shani. One of the letters we received asks about removal of invasive trees on city properties and like privets or trees of heaven. And I was wondering where that would fit. I guess it's some sort of belongs in maintenance, not necessarily in this ordinance, but is there a program to remove some of those invasive trees? So the um, Tree of Heaven and Privets and a few others are definitely on the invasive not protected list. Um, it is part of the Urban Forest Master Plan that we have a program to uh, selectively remove these. We have done some work with our internal staff on this, but we don't have a formal program. So that is something we're looking to expand upon going forward. Thank you. Any further questions? Tell us. Yeah, yeah. I, I, one, one more, and that's um, um, how do you determine, I guess, nuisance, right? I mean, that, that's a pretty, pretty vague and could be, you know, really, uh, I guess, played with. So we, we have a, a very specific definition of nuisance in the early part of, of Title Eight, and I might be able to pull it up for you. Um, but it spells out exactly what constitutes a nuisance. Um, so uh, one thing is, if a resident couldn't just say this is a nuisance because it's dropping leaves in my pool. No, it has to meet the qualifications of the ordinance. Thank you. We, we have uh, five members of the public that are looking to speak. Uh, three in person and two online. I just want to note that we have received five letters uh, as well from Ann Ballin, Claire Elliott, Melanie Grendel, Joe Hirsch, and Catherine Martineau from Canopy. And our, we'll have, our first speaker tonight will be Catherine Martineau. Uh, you'll have three minutes, followed by Rob Levitsky. And I believe there's a, a slide that Catherine has to have put up. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Greenfield, commissioners, and members of the staff. My name is Catherine Martineau. I'm the executive director of Canopy. I'm here uh, tonight on behalf of uh, the Canopy board and the Canopy staff to express our support for the revised updates and our thanks to the staff um, for all of the work and uh, thoughtfulness that has been put in the preparation of this version. We are pleased that um, the important changes that we had um, um, advocated for have been incorporated in this version. More native trees will be protected and the ordinance will align better with um, the tree protection in neighboring cities. That's what uh, this table uh, on the slide shows. Um, I should actually mention that exactly um, a week ago, the East Palo Alto City Council approved their first urban forest master plan for East Palo Alto, and it includes also uh, the, an update to their city uh, tree protection ordinances to strengthen tree protection through measures that are actually similar to those proposed um, for Palo Alto today. 
Another important detail is um, the alignment with the Wheelow Ordinance, uh, the Water uh, Effective um, Landscape Ordinance. This project has been a long time um, in the works. Um, the ordinance you've heard, you know, when it had uh, been first um, adopted and then updated in 2001. Um, in 2018, after that's a few years after the Urban Forest Master Plan for City of Palo Alto was adopted, Walter Passmore started um, the process of updating this, the ordinance, but it was stalled uh, until last summer and uh, um, uh, Chairman Greenfield just, um, or actually maybe it was Peter or both of you explain, you know, what happened at um, uh, uh, when it came in October to City Council and, and the work since then. Um, so we are a little bit behind, but um, we're in terms of timing, but we were very, um, very happy and encouraged that actually it looks like um, there is momentum to get this ordinance passed uh, in early June. And that's because um, the reason why we don't want to delay this too much is that um, in trees, um, large trees are being regularly felled. And at Canopy, we received I'm sorry, a little bit over. Should I stop? Go ahead and finish your thoughts. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So we do receive lots of um, phone calls from residents and uh, people are very upset, you know, when they, uh, see trees go down and this this ordinance uh, update will protect way more trees and frankly there is only one solution we have to lower temp ambient temperature it's the urban forest in urban areas that's the only thing so each time a tree falls down it's uh, like a an air conditioner that is shut off but the the amazing thing with this air conditioner is that it is natural, it is beautiful, and it runs on um, renewable energy, as you all know. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Rob Levitsky, followed by Karen Holman. Chair Speaker Rob, I would request that I uh, display a photo. If you give me a moment to pull it up, please. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm uh, Rob Levitsky. I'm here on behalf of the trees of Palo Alto. Who The trees of Palo Alto have been taking a beating these last few years. I spent the last six years working off and on with Dave Doctor and Walter Passmore and Peter Gollinger to try to understand the existing rules in Palo Alto when it comes to trees, and they're, they've been pretty vague. Um, and so it's important that we get the new tree ordinance approved to tighten up the rules because people have been cutting them down. Here we have a picture of a garage um, and next to it, there was, there was a tree and that's, we can go with the other one. Keep going. Keep going, there. There we have a tree next to the garage. And then on a weekend, it just goes away. None of the rules applied because nobody, nobody applied for a permit. I called Peter Gollinger, no permit called for, hidden behind an LLC and no code enforcement to go chase it down. Now we can afford to buy code enforcement to chase down a leaf blower. Hopefully we can chase down people to cut down oak trees. There's another set that I want to talk about. This is a tree uh, next to the post office. Very large oak, very large oak. And you can see it's kind of our democracy oak that during um, election time, people do their canvassing there at the farmer's market. Well, I heard a chainsaw one day a couple of weeks ago and I come biking over to find a whole bunch of crew up in the trees, you can change the photo, uh, cutting it down. Come to find out, well, planning department, one of the chief planning officials signed a death warrant for this tree 
they were going to take out the another tree and then decided to take four trees that, and uh, one of them is this oak. So here we had the first case we have people cut the trees down without any permit and just hide. Here we have another case where the city sanctions it because one part of the city doesn't know what the other part of the city is doing. And fortunately, I was able to call Peter Gollinger and enough of the tree was left that we can actually have a, a tree still there, but another five or 10 minutes and this tree would have been dead and gone. Another case is just in, in my front yard, a street tree. Well, we're talking about 15, 25% cutting. Well, there's, there were five branches and they just came by a few weeks ago and cut off two of them. 40, 45% of the tree just got whacked by the city. No permit, just some arbitrary decision. So I'm totally in favor of the tree ordinance and I hope we can get some teeth behind it so that the trees don't come falling down Otherwise, we're going to need something like Redwood City has for gunshots, the shot spotter. We're going to need a system that, that can trigger off the, the sound of chainsaws so we can stop these things from happening. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Karen Holman, followed by Winter Dillenbach. Good evening, everybody. And some of you are new to this body, so thank you very much for your service. I really want to thank staff for your um, endeavor on ah, <laughs> your endeavors on uh, working on this uh, much, much, much needed ordinance. I've been thinking a lot lately about the long view and the short view of things. You may know that there used to be a rail line from Stanford University to Santa Cruz, but it was taken out. So we drive on Highway 17. There used to be trolleys in many of our towns, including Palo Alto, that took people to downtown. Most of the trolleys are gone, including in my hometown. So we all drive to downtown. If the long view had been applied, perhaps things would be different. During the pandemic, when traffic was light, the skies were such a deep, rich blue and our air so clean. And there was another thing going on. The birds came back. More birds than we'd seen in a very long time. So why do I bring this up and what do birds have to do with the long view? According to a 2019 issue of Audubon, in the last 50 years, North America has lost one in four birds, not just threatened species, but back, backyard birds. In the Western forest area of study where we live, basically, we've lost 140 million years, a, a million birds nearly a 30% decline. And note this was written in 19, excuse me, in 2019, prior to the last couple of years of devastating wildfires. Other st studies speak of frightening numbers of species going extinct in the last 20 years. The Audubon article lists a few reasons. Noteworthy among them is the significant loss of trees. Ecologist Doug Ptolemy says, every time we force another species into extinction, we encourage our own demise. Okay, so let's bring this back to Palo Alto and the long view. You've heard about the numerous benefits of trees, among them how they clean the air in a major way. They also provide habitat. If birds are the proverbial canary in the coal mine, it seems pretty obvious what we need to do uh, is all that we can do to support a robust urban forest. And with wildfires continuing on an annual, as an annual threat, it seems even more important for cities to support a healthy urban canopy to compensate to the extent that they can for the loss of these forested lands. Consider that projects of all kinds need to embrace trees rather than rely on to replace lost canopy and associated benefits. Consider that when you look at over Palo Alto that rooftops shouldn't replace treetops. Smart, environmentally responsible projects incorporate trees. I could go on about other issues that impact trees and habitat, such as light pollution, but that matter before you tonight is trees. As for our Parks and Commission, I ask and hope that you will keep the long view and broad view in your sights. Do I have just a moment to finish up? Uh, thank you. One of the hats I wear is director of the Board of Men Peninsula Regional Open Space District. We talk trees a lot. What we protect, while exceedingly important, is not the complete picture. It's important that surrounding communities also provide avenues for wildlife migration 
to and from the open spaces, such as the Bay to the Sea Trail and trees. You all have a big hand in whether Palo Alto takes a long view or looks back and wishes we had made better accommodation for trees. It seems clear we need to listen to what the birds are telling us. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Winter Dellenbach, followed, followed by our final speaker, Keith Rechtdahl. Winter, if you would please unmute. Thank you. Trees have essential value for us. We all know trees lend Palo Alto a sense of place with its tree-lined streets and cool tree-shaded parks and preserves that contribute to our civic pride. Trees are lovely, majestic, provide wildlife habitat and simply make us feel good. Also, as science informs us, trees in our urban forest are essential during this time of rapid climate change and need for sustainability. According to UC Davis, proximity to urban trees is critical for interruption of climate change and to foster good human health. All trees sequester carbon, some more than others. The bigger they get, the more carbon they hold on to. Older trees such as oaks and coastal redwoods may contain tons of carbon. So we need to protect the trees we have and we need to plant more trees. Removal of trees releases their stored carbon back into the atmosphere. So we need to be thoughtful about removing trees. Heating and cooling. Environmental professor Brian Stone states, trees are the most effective strategy and natural technology we have to guard against heat in cities. According to the Los Angeles Times, Climate change is supercharging California heat waves. Trees mitigate heat island effects by cooling buildings and homes, lowering air temperature in neighborhoods by up to 10 degrees. The US Department of Energy states that carefully positioned trees may reduce a home's energy costs by 25% and demand for electricity for air conditioning is reduced by shade trees, sparing money and emissions while helping to avoid potentially catastrophic power failures during heat waves. I ask you to this draft tree protection ordinance pretty much as it is written. We must ensure the many critical benefits our urban forest provides if Palo Alto is to keep its climate and sustainability commitments by the year 2030, including increasing our urban forest canopy to 40%. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our final speaker this evening will be Keith Rechtdahl. Thank you. Uh, note that I'm speaking only for myself tonight. Uh, trees improve Palo Alto's quality of life. Whether they're in our parks, in our yards, or along our streets, trees make our lives better. Trees beautify our neighborhoods, provide shade that cools us, create habitats for wildlife, and improve air quality by removing particulates and pollutants. We are fortunate that Palo Alto has a better tree canopy than many neighboring communities. However, our tree canopy is increasingly under pressure. New construction often cuts down large trees that will take decades to replace, Larger buildings leave less room for yard trees, and climate change is reducing the rainfall that trees require to survive. The updated tree ordinance will protect more trees and help preserve our valuable canopy. The ordinance will require practical alternatives to be considered before a protected tree can be removed, and will prioritize planting species that are appropriate for our local climate. My only complaint with the new ordinance is that while its maximum $10,000 fine is significant, I fear in the world of multi-million dollar houses, some builders may consider $10,000 to be a small price to pay in order to build the trophy house they desire. But overall, I strongly support this updated tree ordinance. It is an important step to reserve our tree canopy and the livability of Palo Alto. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comment this evening.
this, this, this is a, a comprehensive, detailed change. It's a lot to digest. Uh, and I'll let, give the commissioners an opportunity to go around and, and make comments and ask further questions of, of staff if desired. Anne, would you like to start? Yes, I would. Um, a couple of things. First of all, thank you very much. Obviously, this is long overdue, and I commend all of the people that have been working on it for, I know, quite a long time. Um, I'm interested in the cost to the city. Um, are we, have we calculated that in terms of staff costs and communication costs and all the other uh, costs that um, uh, will come along with this? Uh, I actually had a uh, fairly substantial meeting today where we were discussing that. Um, we've, oh, been, we've been pulling um, a lot of historical data from our uh, permit system to try and determine uh, the percentage of permits that are routed to urban forestry for review so we can anticipate what that percentage will look like once we expand the number of protected trees. So we are working to try and quantify that. Um, I don't have any preliminary numbers to share with you yet, but we will uh, make sure we detail that out in our staff report to council. And what about staff people um, positions? That's well, also, that, that's, will, that will be well, included as well? Yes, because um, I, I know um, currently, while we are short a few positions in urban forestry, um, we even full fully... Um, I don't want to say enforce, but fully um, implement the the new provisions of the ordinance, and so that's that's part of what our our analysis is going to determine. So, is it possible to explain how the life of a citizen will be different dealing with this tree ordinance going through the process than it is now? Um, it might actually be easier. Um, okay, good. Due to the designated arborist system, a, a lot of the the um, nuts and bolts would be handled by the arborist working with the um, the architect or the builder uh, on a project. Um, so a little bit less would need to be hands-on from the actual owner's perspective. Uh, the difference okay. is more, more projects would need urban forestry review and would need arborist reports because there's going to be a much larger number of properties with protected trees. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I will, I'm sure other commissioners have other excellent questions and I will defer to the rest of them, but I really wanna thank you for, for doing this and um, providing the leadership for it. I think it's really, really important. And I'm so happy that Canopy is in full support and as a partner, that I think that's great. So whatever, whatever they say is a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you to everyone for all the hard work on this. And it uh, cannot be overstated the importance of Canopy. And I, I like the um, mention of mental health and, and just the, the how climate change is just so many, you know, just so many important factors to want to keep uh, our trees. Um, <clears throat> I thought that uh, one of our speakers, Keith Rechtall, made a very interesting point about the $10,000 fine being a, just a cost of doing business. Uh, if a property is $5 million or something, I thought that was a very interesting point. Um, I do have a question on the size that trees are protected and just uh, not knowing enough about uh, trees and, and how they grow. Um, when we're protecting an oak at 11 and a half inches, how long does it, is that like a 40 year old tree, a 50 year old tree, a 30 year old tree? What roughly, as we look at as we look at the DBA, it's the diameter <clears throat> at the breast height. What um, what are the ages of some of these trees? So that's going to depend a lot upon the growing conditions. I would say the fastest that let's say a coast live oak could reach eleven and a half inches, it could possibly be somewhere between twelve and twenty years old. Um, if it's in a, a situation where it's growing much slower, it could be quite a bit older than that. Um, again, it's it's difficult to determine. A, a tree can vary. A tree species can vary dramatically in the amount of growth it puts on per year, depending on conditions. Right, and I just think one of the main points is even if it's twelve to twenty years, the 
time horizons that we look at to replace these trees is so long, you know? And so we, we, we take something out and even though we think it wasn't that big, it, it took 30 years just to get, or 20 years to get 11 and a half inches, which isn't, we think is not that big. And I just think, and these are maybe reasonable standards and on par with the rest of our surrounding communities. But I, I just think to, it's really staggering to think about how long, how much time it takes to uh, replace these trees. And just, again, just something to, to think about, but thank you to everyone for, I know this is took a tremendous amount of time and is very uh, in-depth and, and captures, you know, so many different uh, aspects of what we're trying to accomplish. So thank you for all the hard work. Thank you. Shani? Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the speakers and the people who wrote. I agree with the comments that were made about the importance of the trees in the urban and suburban forest and uh, environment and how important it is to include birds in the trees as well. So this update to the tree protection ordinance is truly critically important at this time. We see hemorrhage of trees in every community in, uh, in our valley uh, due to development, drought, and other things. And when do we do protect trees? I don't know, today I was at the Google campus and they have an egret rookery there. And in a half a block, you have nesting uh, great egrets, um, snowy egrets, black crown night, herons, bluebirds, black phoebes, and a white-tailed kite. And it's just heaven. And the reason they can do that is because they really take care to protect that area during the nesting season. And um, it's, if you haven't seen that on Shorebird Way, I really recommend going to see that. So I wanna go, and now I have a few comments um, about certain parts of this. Some of them were mentioned by others and also by the public. One of the things about definitions, um, again, about the grading permit, I think it should be included. I've said that before. Uh, the tree and landscaping manual as recommended or is written in the comprehensive plan looks for mostly or to prioritize native trees but then it says in section 810030 to include non-native trees um, if, uh, if the arborist recommends that. And my experience is that arborists do not know how to work with native trees. So they usually recommend things out of their toolbox, which doesn't include a lot of native trees. And so I'm a little worried about that. And I don't know how that can be addressed in a way that potentially they can explain why they did not include native tree as the first selection, because mostly it's out of ignorance from what I've seen with various arborists in the region. Uh, and another piece that I think is missing in this tree and landscaping part is that in some areas, allowing thirsty trees that are not drought tolerant would be okay because the water level is, the groundwater level is so high that it can support plants that are not drought tolerant. And I think we should allow that if we know that the groundwater can support the tree and irrigation will not be needed. Also over time, it's possible, and this may be for the future, but uh, it may be possible that there will be recycled water available for irrigation, and maybe we we'll won't have to be as strict about drought. So I would like to have the opportunity for the more thirsty trees to be, at least for now, water. Um, a couple of other comments that I think it's, it's just because I didn't have time to read all the manual but it does talk about replacement ratios and doesn't explain them and whether there are in lieu fees will be allowed or not. And it's probably in another uh, document. So if you can explain a little bit, uh, staff can explain, I would appreciate it. But uh, for now, it's just a question. And then um, this is something that 
During COVID, it was quiet. The birds could sing and there was not a lot of chainsaws in the air. And I'm thinking that during the nesting season, potentially we could limit how much pruning and cutting trees and removing trees can be done. And that potentially in somewhere in the permit um, and in city um, protocols can look at what can be deferred to a time when the birds are not nesting. So September, October, November, December, January. So if you give a permit to someone to, to remove a tree and they don't need to start building tomorrow, can you say, okay, but don't, build, don't remove this tree until after the nesting season? The official nesting season starts in February and ends um, in uh, September. So it would be great a lot of this work was not done during the time that the birds are nesting. And especially in some of the more sensitive areas near the bay, potentially where the city may do some work, don't do it during, during those months. And I think nobody should be cutting vegetation during the months in general, but I know it's impossible to completely prohibit that. But if there's a way to, to incorporate the bird nesting season into this ordinance, that would be a step ahead of a lot of other <laughs> communities, but it's, step, it's a step in the right direction. I'll, See, I might have some more later. That's what I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Yes, thank you. I know this is a lot of work. So thanks to uh, staff and all of the members of the community that were part of this project. Um, I do think the timing is great. Uh, in addition to the challenges with drought, air quality and climate change, there has been talk about the pandemic. A lot of people were home. A lot of people are still working from home. And so they hear what their neighbors are doing. Uh, I do especially like the neighbor noticing piece of this ordinance, 600 feet. I think that's great. I think that our neighbors are gonna be our partners in this in terms of enforcement. Um, and so making sure that that community education um, and rolling out to the, to the broader community um, is essential as this gets implemented. Um, I also like the development moratorium um, to uh, Vice Chair Lamar's point. Um, the fines, a lot of times developers bake that in uh, to their costs, unfortunately. And I think that the development moratorium is a very effective strategy. I know Los Angeles had a very famous case of like a 10 year development moratorium for trees. Um, maybe not that extreme, uh, but I <laughs> don't want to be in the newspaper, but uh, that I do think that is a good strategy um, and would be very effective um, in implementing the uh, ordinance. On the designated arborist system, I also like that it eliminates some of the he said, she said that sometimes the arborists can get into with tree removals and different opinions conflicting with one another. Uh, the staff report said that this would be an RFP process, or it mentioned that it may be an RFP process. I just am concerned that that would be a lot of staff time to redo that RFP and keep it updated um, and making sure that the review of the arborists that are on the list is evaluated in a timely manner to make sure that they're still meeting their requirements and getting maybe annual or um, semi or maybe every other year education um, to making sure that as they have staff turnover over, they're still up to date on the requirements um, in Palo Alto. Um, the one question I really had was on the removal of protected trees section and how that would interact with the state legislation related to SB9 and ADUs. Is this, is this explicitly written so that it would, I, I guess, how would that work if someone were to try and build an ADU through the state legislation building permits and it would, they were, it, 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 which one trumps the other, I guess, in that situation? So I, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, if they followed the state pathway, mm -hmm. we would be able to enforce the tree ordinance up until the point where it would prevent them from being able to build an ADU. So at, when push comes to shove, the state regulations would trump if they're on the state compliance pathway. Okay. If if the um, project would trigger the local compliance pathway, then we would be able to more fully enforce the tree ordinance. Okay. 
so that they were going through the state law, they could take out an oak tree, any sort of protected tree, then the city has no protections no, against that? No, we, we, we would be able to work with them on the approval process to okay. try and save as many trees as possible. But if it came down to where they had to remove one in order to make the project happen or it couldn't happen, then they would have preference under the state law. Okay. So we, we have some leeway, but uh, ultimately state law would trump. Okay. And is that the same for SB9 for the lot splits? I when in the language was written as much as you could do, but correct. If, and we're um, we're consulting the attorney's office now to determine whether or not we should include uh, a bullet point on the subdivision section that would say basically, um, if this happens to be an SB nine, then it you know other conditions may apply. So currently, we only have for subdivision of lots um, repair a hazard or for access. And okay. so that wouldn't really stand up for a single lot split under SB9. I think our original um, intention was for larger projects to avoid okay. wholesale removal of trees on lot lines for larger projects where that doesn't fit the SB9 category. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then the other question I had was on the increase on a risk perspective and how that how you worked with the city attorney's office on that. I know Burlingame had their big incident not too long ago, um, and how the city would monitor tree maintenance of existing street trees and in public areas to ensure that the trees that are protected are kept healthy and that the, as you expand these protections and more trees are, are preserved, there is some, some additional risk that comes with that, both to the property owners with these trees and also to the city. And how was that looked at with the city attorney's office? And is there going to be any sort of additional maintenance or inspection programs of city trees to ensure that they're healthy as more are protected and retained in the city? So trees are protected already. Um, regardless of species or size. If it's a city-owned tree, it's protected. And so we're, our, our procedure for um, removal of a city street tree would have to do with the uh, risk assessment uh, on the tree. So that's, that's something that's already handled internally, and I don't think that would change dramatically with the new ordinance because uh, street trees are determined based on uh, the availability of the particular site. Um, and our goal is to have the largest canopy tree in each site that we can find. So that's, that's kind of how we operate with the street trees. Um, as far as additional risk for private tree owners, um, I believe that our um, provisions for removal of the tree being a hazard would, um, obviously that would need to be determined by a hazard assessment by an arborist, but it would allow for uh, removal of uh, a tree that would be considered a hazard. So uh, I, I don't know that it would dramatically impact that. Okay. Um, and then similarly, are there any other trees that I know you kind of want to keep policy as simple as possible um, and to Commissioner Kleinhaus's point about the drought. And um, I was even thinking about the wooey areas, maybe having certain carve outs or I know Saratoga waves certain things for their wooey area, um, but wanting to keep it as simple as possible. There are some trees that maybe don't fall into the either of the drought um, or the invasive species lists. I'm thinking of like Bradford pears that shed limbs after a certain amount of time that could just cause damage. Was there any consideration to expanding that list to include some of those more risky tree species? It may have been discussed, but I don't think it was ever seriously considered to be included. Um, and that's something that we could look at in a future update. Um, you kind of hesitate to uh, condemn an entire species due to a, a, um, a proclivity, but that is one particular one where I might agree. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, we, we figured it was uh, more concise to follow existing uh, lists that are, are actively maintained by the Cal IPC and by the uh, water use classification of landscape species. That, that seemed like a more um, consistent and, and steady way to determine what would be um, not protected. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be before we move on, Peter, would you like to comment briefly on uh, the maximum fine that's a, a possible for, for a tree being removed that's been brought up a couple of times? Uh, stated as being $10,000, and I think it can increase above that. And also, uh, 
do you want to comment on the RFP uh, uh, issue that uh, Commissioner Brown brought up? Chair, I have a couple of other questions. If we, we, yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just looking to get okay. clarification on this before we move on to, to uh, Nellis and myself. Uh, yeah, uh, first I will answer uh, Commissioner Kleinhaus's uh, question about the replacement ratio. So the, the new tree technical manual, tree and landscape technical manual hasn't been drafted yet. We, we have a, a like a 90% draft that was done before some of the recent changes to the ordinance. So uh, as we get closer to going to council, that's going to go into high gear to get that um, up and ready as soon as we can. Um, the replacement ratios will probably be similar to what's included in the current manual. However, we will probably find a way to prioritize natives. Um, and the, the way the in-lieu fees work is the applicant would have to work with the uh, reviewer to uh, explain why they need to do an in-lieu fee. We're, we're gonna work with them to try and get as many trees in the ground as possible. So it's not a blanket approval when they say, we would like to pay for six in-lieu trees and we're only gonna plant two. Our, our reviewers are gonna say, no, no there's, there's room here. So we're gonna make sure that we get as many trees in the ground as we can. As far as the uh, maximum fee, there are fine. There is some leeway in there, especially if we um, use the administrative penalty process, uh, we can rewrite the administrative penalty schedule and uh, certain violations could be 100 or 200% of the fine. So we do have some leeway uh, on that. It's not, um, it's not set yet. We'll, we'll have a proposal for that when we go before council. Excuse me, isn't there some provision where the, the, the fine would be either a dollar amount or the value of the tree, whichever? Correct. Year? And, and if, if the assessed value of the tree was higher than the $10,000, then it would be the higher value. Um, in certain situations, it could be double the assessed value of the tree as well. And, and what, what kind of a dollar range would could, could a, an assessed value for a tree end up being? Uh, that depends a lot on the situation and the species, but it could be anywhere from thirty to sixty thousand dollars for a, a large oak in good condition. Thanks. And then the RFP question. Uh, so the reason we had uh, considered using an RFP was that was the method that um, Menlo Park used, and um, with concerns over staff turnover, this is um, actually uh, listing the specific arborist. So the arborist by name, not the company. So a, a specific arborist would need to be listed on the list in order to uh, perform anything having to do with um, a designated arborist assignment. So that's that's how Menlo Park is, is arranged. We um, may not end up following in the RFP process. We may do something similar but not a formal process where we are reviewing. Again, I, um, we talked about this at the um, ARB meeting is that um, we think it's really important that we have clear and concise standards that they need to meet. So it's not ambiguous. Um, so if, if the arborist can prove that, you know, um, they're qualified, they um, meet all the uh, certification requirements and they submit um, a sample of their uh, writing for a, a report writing, and it matches up and, and then they would be included in the list. We're, we're not looking to exclude a lot of arborists. We wanna make sure that everybody's prepared to do the right thing. Thank you. Nellis? Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't have a lot to add from what I've already uh, put out there, but I, I will give, uh, I think a big shout out to the public, which I think will be a lot of that, will be helping in the enforcement and making sure that, um, you know, the ordinance is followed. The other thing is to, um, you know, the fact that this took a while, 20 years or whatever, to come to this point is that we treat this as a sort of a living document that is adjust as things change. And I would think that that would also include, you know, adjusting by adding additional trees to the inventory uh, based on uh, whatever that need might be. Um, and then the other uh, uh, point is uh, the, the maintenance. How do, how do we make sure that, you know, trees become diseased over time? But a lot of that can be, I, I guess, avoided by knowing sort of being proactive up front to make sure that those things don't happen like sudden, sudden death and so forth. 
that would prevent, you know, would lead to it taking out trees or more trees. Whereas if you, you know, take care of that issue up front, um, that, 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 that would help. And, and I, I like the, the fact that you're doing sort of a phased in approach to this, uh, which gives the public a lot more time to have a real good understanding of what it is that you're trying to accomplish here and what the benefits are going to be for the, for the public, as well as you know, our neighboring uh, communities, as well as the, uh, the folks who will be responsible for taking care of not only their the private trees, but even the public trees that uh, might be out on the sidewalks and so forth. So that, that's pretty much some of the comments I want to make on that. Thank you. I, I want to thank staff for all of the, the work that they've put into this. It's been a, a, a long process. It, it's a very worthy process. I think it's well established as a long overdue process. Uh, and uh, for our for our city that's named after a tree, we, we, we have a the community has a great value and, and uh, and love for our urban canopy. Uh, there, there are so many important updates that are being included in this, uh, as, as Commissioner Freeman mentioned, looking at this as a, as a living document is very important. Uh, there's many changes that, that, that can go in. It, it may not be perfect uh, from the outset, but it'll be something that we can adapt and can return to this uh, commission to, re to review over, over time to, to tweak in as needed. But, get, but getting the changes adopted as soon as possible really is important for, for our trees. Uh, as someone has spoken as a representative of earlier this evening. Uh, the, the updates are, 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 are broad. Uh, the, in, the increase in transparency and clarity is, is very important. It's from adding purpose statements to cleaning up language uh, to uh, making things more transparent with a, a designated arborist uh, program, for example. The process improvements are, are similarly uh, improving clarity and transparency in terms of application, notice and appeals and, and the enforcement, really uh, making it much more understandable for the overall process for, for tree removal and tree care. The increased tree protections in terms of the uh, increased number of species and the diameter protection is very important. It's, it's a, all fits in very directly with our overall uh, SCAP goals and, and, and trees uh, are really in increasing our canopy and the number of trees is, is low hanging fruit as far as aiming to hit our SCAP numbers and our goals. Uh, I appreciate the, all the effort, the, the complexity and, and do uh, encourage uh, adoption uh, quickly. I think there are there, there were some good comments from the, from the public in the letter. I, I think the idea to uh, regarding the the weed uh, issue uh, on the in, in, removing the removing the redundancy in, redundancy in eight oh eight ten uh, b two and three regarding the indigenous grass uh, that that's worth taking a look at. Uh, I think it's important for everyone to understand. The, the ordinance is, is part of it. The uh, tree and landscape technical manual is, is, is part of this as well, but some of the questions also uh, can be addressed by the city's tree selection tool that's being worked on by Canopy in the city that will help uh, residents uh, go through a process to help understand and get ideas on, on optimum recommended trees uh, based on site conditions. And that'll help uh, in, in the selection and uh, the the Bradford pair is, is not on that list. Uh, I, in, in closing, thank, thank you to the, the commissioners. Uh, do, uh, other commissioners have, have comments and, and I want to give Darren an opportunity to speak as well, if you'd like to. Thank you, Chair, I have no comments. Johnny? Yes. Yeah, I also uh, support your comment about nuisance, the species that uh, native plants should probably not be considered nuisance, but um, the same letter also mentioned a few species that were potentially to add to the protected species list. And I think if not all of them, then at least Western sycamore should be added. The native um, Western sycamores are under threat. They're disappearing from our landscape and we should definitely protect them. Um, 
And so, and the other thing about the nuisance species, I think this was probably copied from a previous version. And when I tried to understand what it's protecting, it seems to be a little excessive. Like you can't have more than three, three feet and you can't have, it's like complete clearance between three and nine feet. And I think we can be a little more uh, flexible than that. So perhaps you can look again at the nuisance um, tree list and the type of um, what consists nuisance, because I think some of the pictures that we saw uh, earlier where huge um, branches were removed is probably because of that. And we need to reconsider some of those removals. I've seen some work like that at uh, Cabberly, and I did not understand why those trees had to be the limbs had to be removed to the extent that they were. It was really large oaks with large limbs that were removed there. So I think reevaluating re what is a nuisance um, branch or tree should probably be a little more liberal at what is allowed to stay on the tree. Um, so those are my comments. Keep the protect the western sycamores because this is a very um, important tree in our landscape. And the nuisance tree, it, it should be a little more um, <laughs> flexible. Uh, one thing about in lieu fees is that in other cities, I will not name, they have a lot of money accumulated from in lieu fees and nowhere to plant trees. They just don't have enough areas where the city can plant the trees. So they have more and more money and nothing to do with it. So. Keep that in mind, we're really discouraging Luffy's and um, potentially identify where the trees are going before you agree to receive, to, to accept that. I don't know if that's possible, but there, there are cities around here that have a lot of money and nowhere to plant the trees. Uh, Follow-up comments? I want to thank the members of the public who joined us in person. It's nice to have people back in chambers. I want to thank everyone who sent in letters and, and spoke uh, online as well via Zoom. And uh, Peter, I want to thank you for uh, all the work that you put into this and for being with us this evening. Uh, it's great to hear such a, a, a confident and, and competent uh, re report on everything and, uh, and uh, understanding that uh, this project is in good hands. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, sir. Did you say something? Sorry, I'm sorry. I, I said thank you, Chair. I, 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 I think the thank you was cut off. Sorry about that. Thanks. No, that, that's, that's okay. This has definitely been um, a, a very large project that was uh, started by my predecessor and there's been uh, a lot of uh, participation from um, staff and from the community to help share the load. So uh, it's definitely a group effort and I'm looking forward to uh, bringing it across the finish line. Thank you. Okay, so we're as good as ever on schedule uh, and, and uh, estimating our agenda items this evening. And we're gonna get out uh, well before 10 o'clock unless there are an uh, inordinate number of board member questions or commissioner questions, comments and announcements and agenda discussion, which I don't foresee, but that's what we're moving on to now. Uh, any, any questions or comments? And then we can talk about future agenda. Do we... Uh, Darren it was requesting uh, some additional volunteer judge support at the Mayfet parade coming up. I don't know if any uh, commissioners ready to throw their hat in the ring yet, or we'll continue to uh, arm wrestle for this honor. Okay, uh, without uh, further discussion, uh, can we talk about our upcoming agendas? Yeah, thank you, Chair. For the May agenda, I've got two for the list. One is on the advanced water purification system at the water quality control plant. The uh, staff there are looking for feedback on their landscaping that's going to be on Embarcadero Road corridor associated with this purification system. 
And so they'll come to the commission and ask for some feedback. And then the second is on the Baylands Comprehensive Conservation Plan. And you're expecting both of these to come next month? Yes. I know we've been wait, waiting for BCCP to, and we'll hopefully we'll get that in. Yes. Next month. That's great. Uh, any other uh, suggestions, recommendations uh, from commissioners? Chair? Yes, Ann. I don't know where this goes um, in the meeting and maybe it isn't uh, ready yet, but um, when we had our retreat and um, Darren talked about priorities for the department. One of them was the um, resumption of more swimming lessons for more kids um, this summer and what the plans were going to be about that. Is there a way, Darren, that there might be a report on plans for uh, summer swim and maybe more group lessons, less private or yeah, thanks, Commissioner Cribs. One option could be I could reach out to them now and get some feedback and email it to the commission and add it to my department report in May. Or if you're looking for something far more in depth, um, maybe we could see about getting it on the agenda. I actually wasn't looking for anything more in depth. It would be great if you could include it in your department report. Thank you. Will do. Thank you. Dar Darren, I have a question for you. Uh, before our next meeting, our work plan will have been approved by city council. Do we need to agendize uh, any discussion of that or would we be able to cover that during our, our ad hoc and liaison discussion? Uh, maybe that's a question you can take back. Yeah, I'm glad to look into that in more detail. My hunch is we could cover it under our ad hoc and our discussions, but I'm glad to to ask more questions and see what some of the other commissions are doing. And we'll also look forward to having a new member join our body uh, at the uh, May meeting. Yes. A new commissioner will be appointed between uh, now and then. Any other comments from anyone? If not, I wanna thank staff as usual for all of their support. And, and time uh, both in the in the meeting and all the all the background time that leads up to this meeting. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to work with you and uh, thank all of my fellow commissioners and uh, wish everybody a good evening. Thanks very much.